Let me welcome all of you. I'm so delighted that you're all here, particularly since the House isn't in session. So you all could have had a break, and instead you're coming to hear us today, and I'm very grateful. My name is Charlie Nemiroff. I'm the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Miami, a school of medicine in Miami, Florida. I'm here representing um, the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, along with the chair of our liaison committee, Dr. Natalie Raskin, who's right here in the back of the room. This is a program that was put together by the American Brain Coalition and the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. So I want to thank the neuroscience uh, uh, co-chairs, uh, represent the caucus co-chairs, uh, Earl uh, Blumenauer and Kathy McMorris-Rogers um, for their leadership. Um, this is truly a, uh, uh, a coming together of the ACMP, one of the uh, members uh, of the American Brain Coalition, along with about a, another hundred organizations. This is a coalition of diverse uh, membership drawn from patients, researchers, clinicians, and industry to help inform Congress about the impact of public policy um, uh, related to neuroscience and how it affects the lives of real citizens. Um, I also wanted to thank um, the staff uh, uh, of the ABC, uh, Megan Perez and Kristen Don Hefner, for their work to build awareness um, for neuroscience research. I'm going to be very brief um, in that I, I just want to talk to you for a minute about depression uh, and about suicide. So suicide is the only top ten cause of death in the United States that's increasing in numbers. Every other top ten cause of death is decreasing, which includes diabetes, heart disease, cancer. We've done a good job in the biomedical enterprise with treatments. But suicide, unfortunately, is increasing. It's gone um, increasingly up since 2009 to the present day. And there are, uh, in, in 2014, uh, there were 43,500 suicides. If you include accidental overdose deaths, um, of which about a third are considered suicide, that number goes up to about 68,000 which would make it about number seven cause of death in the United States. And the large majority of patients who commit suicide have a psychiatric disorder and more specifically have a, a mood disorder, depression or bipolar disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder. All of you know that we've lost more veterans to suicide than to combat this year. And so this is a huge problem in the military as well as in the general population. So what we thought we would do today within the theme of depression is really a brain disease. It's not unlike Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease or multiple sclerosis. We really have two parts of the program. The first um, is one of my own patients um, who I've taken care of since 2009, Beverly Brewster is an attorney in Tallahassee, Florida, and she has kindly agreed to come up and tell you um, about what depression is like and somewhat about her story and what life has been like for her living with depression and hopefully being better um, uh, since we began working together. At least I'm hoping that's what she's going to say. And then Helen Mayberg is arguably the leading um, neuroscientist, clinician, scientist, who is uncovering um, the brain mechanisms that are awry in patients with depression. And she's going to show you, I'm sure, a number of her groundbreaking findings um, about what the brain is like on depression and what happens when patients get better. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce Beverly Brewster. Beverly? Hi, my name is Beverly, and I want to thank everybody for coming today and for asking me to come and speak. There is nothing sexy or attractive about the word depression. Um, it's not a glamorous kind of diagnosis. And it's become too common in our, our everyday parlance where somebody will just say, oh, I'm just depressed today. It truly is a brain disease. and 
I struggled with it all my life. Of course, when I was growing up, I don't even know that there was a diagnosis of depression. I just knew in high school I was very sad all the time. I would appear happy, but inwardly, if anything good happened, it was a matter of, so what? Uh, when I got to college, uh, that kind of sa constant sadness continued, and if relationships broke up, I could not get over it. It would take me years to get over it, and I know that must be a manifestation of my depression. I did not seek professional help for depression until I was in my 30s, and at that time I went to see a family therapist who worked at a local church. And the talk therapy was very, very helpful in dealing with the situations that I encountered. But I realized it was not addressing the brain chemistry, the real problem of changing my brain chemistry, so I would not have that underlying sadness, hopelessness, and despair. Uh, I grew up in Tallahassee, and I went to a family friend who was a medical doctor, and I told him, I said, look, I've got this terrible sadness all the time. I can't seem to shake it. I've tried Prozac. I've tried Zoloft. I get irritable, I, get, I have a quick sw trigger switch, and he said, you probably need to see a psychiatrist, you may have some mental illness. So I wasn't, I wasn't too proud, I was fine to go ahead and see a psychiatrist. And the first diagnosis that was given to me was, you're bipolar type two. And that kind of shook me up a little bit because that's manic depressive and you know, everybody knows scary stories about that. But he was a psychiatrist, and he was well-respected in my community, and I stayed with him for several years. And he kept prescribing drugs, and I kept taking it. And years would pass, and I would have lunch with my friends, and they would say, Beverly, you've been seeing Dr. So-and-so for years, and you're really no better. And I would look in my medicine cabinet, and I would have like, you know, 10 pills every morning or whatever it was. And so I went back to him, and I would say, I need to see somebody else. So I would close that relationship and I would see another local prominent psychiatrist who, to my knowledge, did not question the original diagnosis. So we continued on in trying to treat bipolar disorder, throwing in different new medications, and I would go in and say to him, I'm taking five medications and I'm still not better after quite some time. And he would say, quote unquote, well, there's a new one, let's add this to your cocktail. So I would try it. And then finally I said to myself, if I had something wrong with me like cancer or heart disease, I would seek out the best professional help I could get to treat that physical disease. If I had heart disease, I'd probably go to Emory. Or if I had cancer, I'd try to get to MD Anderson in Dallas. Or is it Dallas Houston? So I said, I need to apply this to mental health. And I literally went online and looked up US News and World Report's ranking of hospitals and medical centers. And in the South, one of the highest ranked at that time was Emory. So I sent an email to the Department of Psychiatry at Emory and I said, in like very few sentences, I've been diagnosed as bipolar disorder. I've never tried to commit suicide. I've never been hospitalized, but no one seems to find the right medication for me. And they suggested two doctors, <clears throat> sorry about this, the older of which was Dr. Nemiroff. <laughs> so I decided I'll go to somebody that's a little older than me. I made my appointment, I got in my car, and I drove from Tallahassee up to Atlanta I met with Dr. Nemiroff. And after he reviewed my file, and the many medications I'd been on, and the fact that they hadn't worked, and my own situation, he said to me, I don't think you're bipolar, I think what you've got is treatment-resistant depression. And at that time, as I said, he was in Atlanta, and I was in Tallahassee. So I coordinated with a local psychiatrist, yet one who I had not seen, who had studied under Dr. Nemiroff, to start from scratch and go from medication to medication until we could find one that may or may not treat my depression, knowing that it might be a situation where I would never find one. This was, went over for several years, and um, Dr. Nimroff then went down to University of Miami, and I communicated with him there and visited him there, 
and we finally did find a pill that would work for me. So I started taking this particular antidepressant, which, can I say the brand name? Brand name is Remeron, and I started gaining a lot of weight. So I found out that Remeron, like a lot of other medications that treat depression or mental illness, will cause weight gain. So I went to my regular internal medicine doctor and I told him about my Remeron and he said, you know, when I was an intern, he said, we used to give a Remeron to patients who were in nursing homes to help them put on weight. So I had the choice of continuing with the antidepressant that would help me feel better. I got to the point where I was not considering suicide every day. And it was never a dramatic thought, like, oh, I'm going to commit suicide, you know. And it, kind of, it was just like some, you know, your best friend might be. But life was just had absolutely no joy. And I would sit there trying to think of a way that I could end it without things being too messy. Luckily, this particular antidepressant worked for me. But I had to make the choice of whether or not I wanted to suffer with the side effects, mainly the weight gain. Uh, there was a time when I did go off it because I was tired of being so fat, and it wasn't too long before my mood started to, to sink again, and I became irritable again, and I got back on the Remeron. Today, I don't ever think about depression, and I know so many people out there who are in a community who have seen one or two psychiatrists, even in my own, own community, and they think that that, if those doctors do not have the answer, there is no answer. And the one thing these people need to have is hope. Just because if you know somebody in a similar situation, if they've seen two or three doctors in your community, encourage them to treat this as a brain disease. It's a medical disease. Where would you go for the best treatment? And, have, and try to get them an appointment. Now, luckily, I had the type of insurance where I could just make the appointment online. That has been a stumbling block for a lot of people. But I was able to do that. I had the freedom to do that. A lot of people don't. It takes energy to fight this. And if you don't have the energy, then sooner or later, I'm afraid you're just going to give up. So it's important that people are given hope that this can be taken care of. Um, if I could talk to psychiatrists, I would say, don't get lazy with your patients. I think all, all professionals do. Don't fall into that rut. If somebody comes in and they're not getting the proper treatment and they're not turning around, after several years, you know, swallow your ego and question whether your diagnosis has been correct or help that patient get help with somebody who may approach it from a different angle or somebody who may be at an institution that has the funding that can get the proper research and get on the cutting edge of what's going on with depression. Um, to patients, or if you have friends who are depressed, and I think everybody does, um, my water? Is this my water? Thank you, sir. Dry mouth is probably part of the side effects. But if you do have friends, um, don't let them give up. If they have to put, you know, a trip on their credit card to get proper medical care, get them to see somebody else who is not in the same community, who doesn't go to church with the same doctor that you're, you're currently seeing, get them out there so to somebody who's exposed to what's on the cutting edge in mental illness. When I first went to see a psychiatrist in Tallahassee, the first thing I said to him was, please see that I make it to age 50. And he did do that. I made it to a little past 50. But it's important that people who have depression, and if you know them, or if it's you, knows that there is hope out there. But as you know, it's not something like you hurt your knee and you get an MRI and the doctor looks at the MRI and he can diagnose it. The doctor is limited in diagnosing with so much these days in some communities with what the patient actually tells them. 
and it's a subjective kind of thing. I would like to see it get to the day where somebody can take a blood test or do an MRI and say, well, you're, you're prone to some type of mental illness or you're not, maybe we're getting there. But until we really see mental illness and depression, be careful how you use that term, as truly a brain chemical disorder in the brain and start treating it and uh, educating people on that, uh, I fear we're gonna lose more people to suicide. And it's really not necessary. So um, in that vein, I, I don't know that I really have anything else to say. Um, there is hope. I'm now participating more in my community. I have friends, and as I said, I don't think about depression. I do um, dog rescue as my hobby. And I continue to practice law for the state of Florida, which has its up and down rewards. But if you're on the right antidepressant, you can get through that too. So anyway, I'm just here to tell you that it can be treated. It takes time. So whoever you know that is depressed, just tell them not to give up and to keep hope. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some questions, so if there's any questions for Ms. Brewster, um, we can entertain them at this time. Or later if they want to talk privately. Or we could talk privately later, or um, we could talk as a panel after Dr. Mayberg's presentation. So let me um, introduce Dr. Mayberg. I, I was delighted when I was uh, in Atlanta to recruit um, Helen Mayberg to the department at Emory and she was a pioneer when I recruited her and she's remained a pioneer uh, to this day. There's nobody who has received more recognition uh, uh, who has published in the very best journals in the field and who has done groundbreaking work, really pioneering work on trying to understand what's wrong with the brain in patients with depression. Um, Helen has taken this from um, studies of brain imaging um, into um, developing novel treatments for people who don't respond to medication or psychotherapy. So uh, you're in for a real treat, so um, uh, hang on to your seats. You're going to get a phenomenal tour from one of the leaders in our field. Let's welcome Dr. Mayberg. So it's a pleasure to be with you, and Beverly, thank you for your thoughts. And I'm a neurologist, not a psychiatrist, and as I listen to Beverly speak, what I realize is that you actually need to see pictures of the brain. You know, if somebody was talking about a broken bone, they'd show you an x-ray. But I think um, us being together is I've put together a presentation to actually talk and show you the brain so that you can have an objective view to understand how Beverly struggled. Because at the end of the day, the fact that we just talk about depression and somehow you'll talk to the right person, you've gotta go online and do this, I want you to substitute depression for thinking about what it would be like if you were talking to someone with heart disease or a broken bone or an infection or cancer and what the standards are and what the expectations are and we want to talk about parity, we want to talk about research, but we need to have data that will put us in the position to get people what they need. I'm going to talk about work from what I call my um, depression biomarkers team at Emory. I'm showing you some pictures um, on the left, Bodie Dunlop, who's um, a psychopharmacologist, a psychiatrist, Ed Craighead, who's a psychotherapist, Elizabeth Binder, who's a psychiatrist and a geneticist, um, and the people on the right are actually my students that are imaging specialists. And what you see is that to actually solve this problem, you can't just say it's the brain. You actually have to have a team that will work together to think about it not from just one point of view, but from multiple points of view. And this was enabled um, by Dr. Nemiroff when he brought me down from Toronto. And um, some, some of this work is um, work that we um, did together and that has um, proceeded um, after he moved to Miami. Much of it is funded by NIMH, um, but most of it not. 
Um, and I think, again, um, what I want you to take away is it takes big teams to do the work. It takes money, and I'll try to explain why it takes the amount of money that it does. Because you actually have to have teams that are experts in therapy, experts in drugs, experts in imaging, experts in engineering, in order to actually work out the detail to maybe derivatize what you want to do to a talking point, a lab test. You know, how do we get what we want, which is matching patients objectively to a treatment that they need? So, what's a biomarker? You know, biomarkers in medicine, this is a new buzz phrase. And I think as you heard with, from Beverly's story, as she struggled to find the right treatment, wrong diagnosis or the wrong treatment has sort of unambiguous consequences in medicine. If you have chest pain, maybe you just have indigestion, but you go to the emergency room and someone doesn't talk to you about it, they do an electrocardiogram and they look to see if you have ischemia. And once they diagnose that you're having a heart attack, they don't flip a coin to decide you know, you're gonna go home and eat better and exercise. You're gonna go to the OR and have um, open heart bypass surgery. They do an angiogram and they look to see what the status of your heart vessels is and they make a decision based on data. Or think about if you find a breast mass. You don't just like cross your fingers or um, decide what you can afford. They take a biopsy now they actually determine what the receptor type is and you get treated with a drug that's specific to that type. And you can want a drug, but if it's not right for your cancer, doesn't matter how much money you have, you're not eligible and it wouldn't be good for you. And if that seems too esoteric, you know, if you have a cough, someone can give you penicillin, it might work probably won't hurt you unless you have an allergy, but it's actually, no matter how cheap it is, penicillin doesn't work for tuberculosis. So you grow out whatever you're coughing up to determine what the treatment is that's best for you. The fact that I'm even saying that is absurd or should feel absurd to you, and I'm doing it on purpose, because in fact, we treat psychiatric patients as Flip a coin, you don't have the right insurance, this drug is cheap, we can do trial and error. We should all be ashamed. So, head of NIH, you know, the White House has put huge money behind the idea of precision medicine, and it's oriented at the first phase to cancer, and we all want cancer to be treated as soon as possible because people die while well, we'll try to figure it out. But I want to make the point that research is needed to find biomarkers for mental illness as well, because as you heard from Beverly's story, one size does not fit all, and the process is trial and error, while someone hopefully has the energy, perseverance, knowledge to figure it out. And so how do we think about the strategy to do that for depression? So what are the numbers? You heard some from, from Dr. Nemiroff, but we have lots of medicines. They have been evidence-based, tested, and proven effective in groups of patients so that they're available for market, but one size clearly does not fit all. The numbers are actually very sobering. You go to the doctor, you have depression, the likelihood that you will be well with the first treatment that is selected to you is less than half, 40% based on studies. Um, and that doesn't matter whatever treatment is being evaluated. And we want people well. We don't want them just better with residual symptoms. Um, worse and more sobering is that over time, people evolve and can develop a treatment-resistant state, and it's estimated to be about 10% of people who have a depression. And there really isn't any predictions as to how it's going to go for you. And there's been a lot of um, energy invested in genetics that's not really panned out. Genetics is important. Um, um, there are various ways to try to look at combinations of predictors, but so far it hasn't gone well. I think you've heard some of the consequences of getting the wrong treatment. There are side effects. 
there's continued disability, um, including suicide. Um, it actually, the numbers are is that most people do not persevere. The illness makes you feel as though, well, you know, I probably can't get better anyway, it didn't work, and I'm not a good patient. A lot of times, after the first treatment, people don't go back. Um, people's insurance plans doesn't pay, despite the fact that, you know, if your blood pressure is having trouble or you won't stay on your diet and you continue to have high blood pressure, you continue to get paid for. But how we have and work toward mental health parity needs to be addressed as well in this space. And, you know, we don't even know if actually the brain might be damaged by actually being treated with something that doesn't work. So we have some pretty basic goals. Get out of episode as fast as possible, match people to the optimal treatment, and avoid something that won't work for them. And third, we need biomarkers of this. We need tests like we have for everything else that are robust, reliable, accessible, and cost-effective. So there was evidence in a very, very large clinical trial um, that the NIMH funded, STAR-D. If, you know, just talking about or listening to Beverly isn't enough, the data says if you don't get better on that first pass treatment, you have diminishing returns for additional treatments. And the likelihood of staying well if you keep going down the path of needing other treatments is low. So we need biomarkers. Now, Dr. Nemiroff published a paper many years ago um, that was a first clue that one size doesn't fit all and, and made the observation as part of an industry-sponsored trial um, that was comparing a drug to a type of psychotherapy. The dogma is that in every trial that people can get equally well on average to drug or psychotherapy, and everyone does better with both. And what actually um, Charlie observed by looking further into that study was if people had early life trauma, there was a shocking, you know, third of the subjects in this industry-sponsored trial had that, that actually the story was very different. Um, people with early trauma in that study did better on therapy than drug, and there was no added value of the drug. Said another way, they needed therapy. It was a study of chronic depression, so they'd been on drug a long time. This was a new drug. So again, that was a clue without a biomarker, and not everyone, thank God, has got early life trauma. And, um, and so I want to move to the brain, because in fact, you know, depression is complicated. It's not, you know, the diagnosis is, is quite straightforward, and it is, you know, a clinical interview. But we need to get it to where, you know, chest pain isn't necessarily heart disease. You know, how do we have objectifying something that we can describe, but that we actually want um, evidence to make it um, systematic, that um, we can make these diagnoses and try to think about what are contributors to both the cause, what are things in the environment that can make it worse, and how do all those things affect the brain? And you know, we know that women are more likely to have a higher incidence of depression than men. We know it runs in families. We know that um, there may be prenatal insults. It's really bad to be traumatized in early life in terms of developing um, mood disorders later. Um, medical illnesses can certainly interact. All these things converge on your brain. So the question is, is where in the brain? Your brain is in a bowl of soup, add a chemical and stir. Brain is organized, the connectome. It's a set of modules, a set of neurons organized in groups. Groups are kind of collectives, kind of families, talking to other families, or thinking about neighborhoods connected by roads. Whatever kind of visualization you want as a non-neuroscientist is their maps. And the question is, is what kind of maps can we use? We have all kinds of maps. We have maps of um, the brain in action. We have maps of the brain structure. We have maps of the gray matter, the white matter, the cabling. We can take pictures with a PET scanner and measure chemistry or metabolism or blood flow. We can make measurements with MRI scanners, including surrogates of blood flow. We can do brainwave studies with EEG. And I'm going to tell you about ones where um, we've looked at maps with PET scanning and MRI scanning to give you some examples. 
So, you know, this is not just reflects my age, but, you know, we've been trying to study maps of depression for many years. And even in the first days when you could look, you know, 30 years ago at the brain in action, put someone in a scanner, see the activity in the brain in real time, this was unbelievable. And there were studies done early on, um, first at UCLA, where depressed patients were put in a scanner compared to non-depressed patients. You can see on the left, um, you don't need to be a neuroscientist, just kind of look for a pattern and look for the break in the pattern and follow an arrow. The frontal lobes were underactive in people who were depressed. And many, many people replicated that finding. Our data is at the bottom. We saw it in Parkinson's, Huntington, stroke, Alzheimer's. If you had depression, everybody's frontal lobe, regardless of the diagnosis, was low. And then there was one study that studied some familial unipolar depressed patients on the right and actually showed that it wasn't that the frontal lobe was down, it was that the frontal lobe was overactive. So suddenly everybody kind of went, okay, well, what's, what's that? And everybody tried to figure out how were one team's patients different from everybody else's. And everybody kind of got lost in what somebody was doing wrong as opposed to seeing the clue that actually there was a subtype there. And also depression wasn't just about your frontal lobe, there were other regions involved. So what was one of the first clues that variability might have to do with what you might get better with? So the top is a PET scan, red means the activity is going up, blue means the activity is going down, I'm not gonna test you on what brain area does what. But what happened was is you treated a depressed person with Prozac, or a group of depressed people with Prozac, low frontal lobe went up, and there were areas of the brain that actually went down, but there was a difference between people that looked identically depressed, who got better, versus those who didn't. And you can see in that second row, there were changes that were missing. And so then we asked the question, well, maybe they, their brain patterns were starting from a different place. So we looked at the starting point before we had treated and looked at the difference between people who got better and people who didn't. And we saw that area is labeled number 24, where people who went on to do well on Prozac had overactivity in that region, in the cingulate, that's the name of the region, and those people who did badly had low activity there. And we took a bunch of other patients that we had scanned, we knew if they gotten better or not, we saw that same pattern was seen. High in responders, low in non-responders. Had nothing to do with the frontal lobe in predicting. And other people started to see that finding. They could make a, an estimate of that region with brainwave studies with EEG. People were seeing with many drugs that people got better all had overactive brains. They were starting to say that might be really helpful. The problem was it had only been done within a treatment. It doesn't really help you to know, might help you to know, might this person do well on that treatment. But what we want is a situation that Beverly is talking about is how do you pick a treatment for a person given that there are lots of choices. So as you start to think about what we'll call a treatment specific biomarker for treatment selection, what we had started to notice, because we were interested in what's the network in the brain, what's the connectome, what are all the what are all the players, all the regions that might be contributing to the syndrome? Because there's mood, there's thinking, there's circadian rhythm problems that people don't move as much, there's anxiety. Which, which compartment does what things? That's what neurologists are interested in. You know, where in the brain does what? And so we were building this map of, of what regions do what, and we were using depressed patients that came in for different treatments. So I didn't really care personally if you're being treated with drug or being treated with therapy. If you were being treated effectively, I wanted to know how your brain changed because I wanted to know which regions were most important. So we um, studied what's your, how does your brain change when you're treated with cognitive behavioral therapy? I mean, you know, people think like, you know, that's not a brain change. That's, that's retraining your brain. You better believe your brain changes. And the question is, how does it change? And we thought, well, when people get better, you know, it must be the same pattern of change. Well, it turns out your brain on cognitive behavioral therapy changes differently as you go from sick to well, 
than on drug. And different treatments affect the brain in different ways. So you're back to that same question. If different treatments normalize or change it in an effective way, then obviously something's different. The starting place has got to be different because the ending place is different. So how do we think further about that? And one of the first studies when I got to Atlanta was to say, we know how the brain is changing with these different treatments. What do we really want? So sat down, Charlie, with Bodhi, with Ed, and kind of said, what is the real fundamental question we need for patients? It isn't just about changing. So we've got to be able to have patterns that will work for individual people. We want to have or know a pattern that will say, you need this treatment, but you should not take this treatment, you know, this other treatment, that you want equivalency of what are the first ways that we treat people? How do people come to treatment? You know, do they go to a therapist first? We heard about Beverly, who then got referred to get medication. Those are two equivalently effective ways to treat depression. So let's work to see, is there a way that we can stratify to decide, do you need therapy or do you need drug? And set up the experiment that way to see if we can bind a marker. So we used our PET scanning that had been so helpful up to that time point to measure very simply brain metabolism. We recruited patients who had a major depressive episode. We did a scan, we flipped a coin, and they got either 16 weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy by expert therapists, or they got 16 weeks of, in this case, uh, a very common um, antidepressant escitalopram for 16 weeks, delivered by expert psychopharmacologists, came in every couple of weeks or whatever the regimen was, waited, waited, waited on my side. I did the scan, wait, have to have experts treat, rate, have reliable information when you're done. And at the end of 16 weeks, the question was, are you well or should you not have bothered? We aren't interested in what's in the middle. If we're trying to find a biomarker, we don't want the maybe sort of. We want the clear win, clear loss. So we analyzed the data and said, is there brain changes that actually will explain Thunder, next. Um, you know, are, is there a brain change that will tell me yes, no for CBT, yes, no for drug, and the interaction, kind of yes, CBT, def, you know, definitely not drug, and vice versa. And we did the scans, we do the analysis, you know, hocus pocus, you know, black box, pull a rabbit out of a hat. And we had six candidate regions in the brain that met that criteria. And as we looked at these regions, and, and you know, I won't give you a test on this either, we found that we needed it to be that it was you know, therapy or drug, you can get better, is there a region? And equally within a treatment, yes or no. And there was one region that stood out in the bottom corner, the insula. It's an area of the brain that's actually really interesting because it's where you have gut feelings. It's where you have the icky, painful, can't quite describe it. It's called your interoceptive awareness area. So it was very interesting that this was a region that if it was overactive, you did great on drug, therapy didn't touch you. If it was underactive, you did great on therapy, drug didn't touch you. So you have this perfect biomarker that basically says, I could do a scan and depending on the state, I would be yes, no in either direction, which had kind of been the goal. So part of it is to set up that you believe it because you've done equally good treatment in both sides and then let the data tell you if any place in the brain could help you to know that. I mean, that's what the experiment was. So then you say, well, those dots are actually individual subjects. So this isn't just on average. That for the most part, this did very well to separate these people with this first line of treatment. So then, but then, you know, to have it actually be meaningful, well, they got randomized, so flip a coin, 
we gave everybody in the study the treatment they weren't randomized if they didn't get all the way well. So then we could ask the question at the beginning, if you finally got well with the second treatment, could you have predicted that you really needed that second treatment? And it turned out the people who had low activity in green, when they finally got CBT, they got well. People who had overactive insula, when they finally got drug, drug added second, they got well. And it didn't work for everyone, but you can start to see the idea that the, it isn't like therapy is the, you know, the, the secondary choice or you're really not as sick. These people are equivalently ill. There was nothing about them that you could distinguish, but it turned out that this activity in their brain could distinguish these subtypes. So again, you know, this notion of every psychiatrist, every clinician has by their experience a, a gut instinct on what they think will be best for a person. And, and someone like Dr. Nemiroff, he's a wizard. I mean, I'd send any patient to him because his gut instinct is usually right because he's seen everything. But that's just because he's experienced. He doesn't really know. I mean, he has some kind of marker in his head, but every time you put those clinical instincts to the test to make these decisions, it never works in the research. So this is a first example of not just within a treatment, but across treatment that there might be a biomarker. And what we're doing now is we're actually testing it prospectively. We do a scan now, a new NIH grant. We do the scan, and we treat you by your brain type. And we look to see if it works better than flipping a coin. So you know, when this paper first came out, it got you know, chatted up by the Wall Street Journal. You know, it got chatted up by everybody. And everyone says, who would do a scan in people who are sick to decide how to treat? You know, just start, and if it doesn't work, go to something else. And they got into kind of a, an argument on the Wall Street Journal kind of internet channel where you know, the guy in charge says, I don't think I'd want to be sick an extra four months. You know, so when you start to think about what is the price of the wrong treatment, you know, to have therapy and have your brain not be ready to have therapy, you know, therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy is not easily accessible. But there is a whole group of people who are only going to get well if they have therapy. So we have to kind of change our mantra. You know, we look at, look at what we do for people with certain kinds of cancer or certain kinds of conditions that are in a very small part of the population, very expensive drugs, they get it. So that this can't just be about cost, it's gotta be about seeing that people have a subtype of an illness and they need the treatment that's best for them. What we also learned is there are some people who didn't get well on either, and they have a different biomarker. They have overactivity in a region called Area 25, which was quite interesting because that's a region, region that we target with um, a different treatment um, with brain stimulation. But I just want to kind of show that with a PET scan that's done with a radioactive um, injection. So that's not available for children or wouldn't be done in children and it's um, expensive and not available everywhere. So we wanted to see if we could get the same kind of answer if we did it with functional MRI because that would be more accessible. Set up the same kind of experiment. This time we did it in people who'd never been treated, which was a hard study to do. This was a study that Dr. Nevaroff initiated. Um, we randomized people to CBT again, but now two drugs to be more inclusive. Same design, did an fMRI, just analyzed the data a little different. And we actually got a pattern similar to the previous pattern. Three regions, all equally good. Didn't quite do as well as the PET scan on individuals. But in fact, we're starting to see that pieces of the network that we've described before can stratify the state that they're in can be different in different people. And clinically, they look alike. But in terms of how they respond to treatment, it's different. We can get very involved in why these regions and how they connect to each other. We can link it to all kinds of neuroscience that's going on in the connectome. We can think about how it links to particular aspects of depression and why those systems might go wrong. And I think even beyond thinking about treatment selection, knowledge like this through research 
knowing which regions are really drivers when you know all brain regions are in some way you know six degrees of separation I mean human connectome is about how do all these neurons talk to each other and how do we get the master wiring diagram of the brain well we actually by knowing these wiring diagrams by knowing these patterns by knowing which which components of the brain are most important for a given disease we actually design new treatments so by knowing the wiring diagram for Parkinson's we can give dopamine drugs, but when dopamine drugs stop working, we can put electrodes in the brain and we can tune the circuit directly. 150,000 people around the world have had deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. We took everything I've just described in terms of mapping out a depression circuit to design a treatment based on stimulating a node, as you've described, in resistant patients beyond what Beverly has described, and, and that's a nightmare I, I certainly wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. What do you do when you actually don't even respond to shock therapy? We can now, with this kind of knowledge through research, know and target a node in this depression network and actually tune depressed people who respond to nothing. And it's all by this systematic research to try to map out who gets what? So like I said, as a neurologist, I don't treat anybody with depression. But, you know, certainly I need a therapist. I don't do therapy. You know, how do you use that? If you need therapy, that's a map in your brain and you should get it. If you have the map that needs drug, you get that. If you have the map that gets better on nothing, then maybe an electrode is what you need. It's all equal potential based on what the brain is telling you is the right approach. So what do we do next? Can we work backwards now that we've actually got the phenotypes, clinical phenotypes, and these brain maps, and these candidates? Can we start to work backwards to actually understand why are people at risk? How do genes and um, early life trauma or inflammation or many of the things that people are investigating, how do they impact these brain networks. And I think, uh, just to close, that what we really want is to imagine the brain as a dynamic system. You know, you're minding your own business with whatever your genetics, your life experience, you're in some kind of homeostatic balance, and something happens. You know, the million dollar question is, is what sets off a depressive episode? And the brain tries to compensate. And the way in which it tries to compensate is what makes these maps. So are we looking at, when we look at these maps, at the lesion? Or are we looking at whatever happened and how the brain tried to compensate? But you're seeing that even though the brain is a dynamic organ, that it will assume a position, a state that we can map that can help guide our treatment, like measuring renal function. You know, kidneys always changing, you know, your cardiac output. To actually see these maps as a window, a snapshot of how the brain is doing and that we can help it to move in one direction or the other by these kinds of systematic sorts of studies. So I think that um, the next steps are more research and um, I'm appreciative that we, we have some small grants to try to do this. Um, it was hard. Uh, when we went to get the renewal on having the insula biomarker, you want to know what the review said? Why don't you do something, why don't you look at some other biomarker as opposed to, no, we derived a biomarker, let's test if it works. We've certainly heard the criticism, well, who's going to do a scan? Let's figure out if the brain type is real. That's why you do a replication. Then we can work to find a surrogate that we might be able to do easier. On the other hand, you know, if you need a brain scan to make the diagnosis and to decide how to treat, then you should get a brain scan. In the same way, I don't see anybody trying to figure out a substitute for an angiogram or a receptor test in cancer. So again, mental illness can't be the second class citizen in terms of, well, you know, do we really expect that people with, with brain disorders should expect a scan? Certainly, my neurology patients wouldn't, wouldn't imagine I talk to them to figure out if they have a brain tumor or a stroke 
or multiple sclerosis, they expect a scan. And I think that mental Ill, mentally ill patients of all diagnosis should expect the same. So to end, I mean, the goal is robust, reliable, accessible biomarkers that we can use clinically. And I think that it's really about treatment parity and that treatment parity will evolve based on biology.